Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for ourselves this morning is found and quoted for us in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Let me highlight for you verse 14 and verse 18. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies. But the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left. And they are seeking to take my life. But I have preserved in Israel 7,000 whose knees have not bent to Baal and whose lips have not kissed him. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue with prayer. First of all, God, we thank you for the awesome gift of your holy word, for the awesome gift of your grace, mercy, love, and compassion that is found throughout our lives. But all too often, it's easy for us to forget all of those things when the trials and the tribulations and the difficulties of this world come upon us. Be our help, our stay, our guide, and lead us always to the marvel of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. So do you know what some of the most dangerous thoughts in the world are? It is those thoughts, it's those words where we express, and I'll simply call it, proud ignorance of the facts of something. Now here's what I mean. Now, dear people, it's, it's bad enough when we don't know the truth about something or the reality of a matter, but I think it's quite another thing when we don't know and we stubbornly refuse to hear or even to learn the truth or maybe the other side of a situation. And, and that's really the issue that I speak about. So let me give you some examples of, of what I mean. So recently a discussion broke out on social media and it broke out because of an original statement that had been made and that original statement was really a, a very anti-religious statement. So when I made a comment and my comment simply asked that person if they had thought out the complete implications of what was said, that person and then a number of others immediately jumped in and it was clear they were hostile to Christianity. Now, during that tirade against the Christian faith, one comment was that basically Christians were foolish. Christians were foolish because they followed a book that had been edited, changed, and rewritten over the years. Yet in truth, there is not any solid evidence that such is true about the Bible. Fact of the matter is, we have the original Hebrew. We have the original Greek of the Bible. And then we have numerous copies of the Bible. We have so many other copies, more copies than any other ancient book. You could say 50 times more, but actually I think it might be like 500 times more than any other ancient book. Well, what's happened? What, what's, what's caused these, well, and they were younger people. What's happened? That these younger people should be so hostile to the, to the Bible. Well, well, somewhere along the line, these young people had some sort of Comparative religion course, probably in their school somewhere, a course that gave absolutely false information on the Bible, and they simply believed that. And, and what's worse, there is nothing, there's absolutely nothing you and I could ever do to change their mind. Because they think they know the truth, and they will defend their ignorance of that truth even to the end, or what they think is the truth even to the end. Now, make no mistake. They will also accuse me of the very same problem, except here's the difference. I know what they were taught, I know why, and I know that they have no idea, no idea at all, nor are they willing to ask about what I know and what I was taught. And there, dear people, is the difference, and there, why, there is why such thinking is so dangerous. Find both sides of the situation and learn both sides of things. Or how about this, uh, this similar classic thing? People like to go around and say, well, as long as I know the truth, that's all that counts. And that's applied most often to the issues of religion, and that's really especially applied to the Christian religion, 
And of course, I kind of understand the confusion because Satan has done a marvelous job of confusing God's truths. <coughs> did, did you catch that? God's truths. Because the Christian faith isn't just about one truth. It's really hundreds of truths that fit together to make a complete picture of God. Now, here's a fact. I'm a pastor. I spent a great deal of my time in school learning about God's Word, every nuance of God's Word there is. And I spent a great deal of my life surrounded by God's Word and working at what it says and what it reveals. And I find that I have to constantly work to keep the truths of God's Word free from error. Do we forget that Jesus warns about the little bit of leaven? That warning was given so that we would keep away from error even a little bitty, teensy, weensy bit of error. But what has happened with so many, so many people, is that that little bit of error gets in, that little bit of leaven gets in, and before you know it, the truths of God's word are affected. And worse yet, it, it's so often such a slow process that the people don't even realize that the truths they think they know have now been affected. And the truths that they, they used to know, they've been changed to lies. And now the fact is they actually believe the lies instead of the truths. I mean, just ask yourself this. How is it that there are so many, so many church bodies today that so easily deny basic truths of Scripture? Well, my favorite passage in this particular regard is found for us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, and it says this. For there will come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in line with their own desires. They will also turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Seriously. There are churches out there, many, many, many churches that deny basics such as what? The existence of sin or the facts of creation. They deny the physical resurrection of Jesus or they might even deny the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. They deny that the Bible is God's word or you might even find that they actually deny even the existence of God. And people, I'm talking about so-called Christian churches. Those who are supposed to teach the truth and the wonder of God. But that's my point. Knowing the truth and keeping the truth alive and well, that's, that's something we constantly need to work at, constantly need to be aware of. And then, of course, there's that dangerous statement that's found in today's text. I alone am left. You know, here's the excuse that Elijah used in order to give up on what the Lord had told him. It is an excuse that provides a remarkable lesson for us. So let's consider our text under this theme, a lesson on faith. Now, do you know what Elijah's problem was in, in, in this particular instance? His problem was that he was all wrapped up in himself rather than focusing on what God wanted and what God had recently accomplished. That this is evident is seen in the circumstances that surround this particular text. Circumstances that show the foolishness of Elijah's thinking. So that leads us to ask, well, what has happened recently in Elijah's life? Well, Elijah recently, actually for the last three and a half years, has been eating from a jar of flour and a jar of oil that did not run out. He and the widow of Zarephath. Elijah has just recently raised the widow of Zarephath's son from death. Elijah, at the Lord's command, has ended the drought over the land of Israel. That's the three and a half years drought that was there. And then next, Elijah had taken on the 450 prophets of Baal. You remember that story? Calling fire down from heaven. Whose God would do that? And Elijah won this, this awesome showdown with an awesome display of, of God's amazing and marvelous power. And then, 
Elijah ran ahead of the chariot of King Ahab on the way to Jezreel, and we're told they were outrunning a storm. So they weren't going slow, but Elijah ran ahead of that chariot. Such things are what have recently gone on in Elijah's life. And clearly, the hand of the Lord, the wonder and the power of God are on display in his life. Now, you would think that with such wonders behind him that Elijah would be as bold as brass and Elijah would stand firm and sure in what God wanted him to do. But when Queen Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah, he runs. He runs like a scared rabbit. Instead of trusting the, that the Lord was with him, in tr instead of trusting that God could and God would be on his side and that God would help him through this scary threat to his life, he runs. Now, I personally think that the Lord had given Elijah some clear directions on what he was to do. And those are the directions that are given to us with the addition of one more thing. But instead of doing those things, Elijah just ran. And honestly, that's why he's in the wilderness. And not only does he run, but even when the angel of the Lord appears to Elijah, not part of our text, the angel of the Lord appears to him and strengthens him with food. Even when that happens, Elijah still wants to complain. Elijah still wants to quit. Not exactly what one would expect from a man who has just achieved some tremendous victories, especially when those victories show clearly that the Lord God is on your side. But again, I maintain that Elijah's problem was that he was all wrapped up in himself. He was concerned with how Elijah felt. He was concerned with what Elijah wanted. He was concerned with how Elijah thought things should go. Now, Elijah was all hung up on Elijah. And, and no wonder he comes up with this incredible excuse that ends, I alone am left. By, by the way, I, I think we still find that excuse in today's world. Tell your kid that they can't do what the other kids are doing, and what will you hear? Everybody else gets to, and if you really pay attention to that, you recognize that that's the same excuse, isn't it? That's the same as saying, I'm the only one who can't. That's the same excuse of Eli as Elijah. And in our religious world, we, we do the same thing when it comes down to the practice of fellowship or simply standing up for the importance of God's teachings. Well, we don't. We, we become afraid and we say to ourselves, I'd be the only one against everyone else and, and I just can't do it. Or God tells us parents to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to stand firm in demonstrating and practicing our faith, but we don't. And often our excuse is, well, none of the other families that I hang out with do that. And I don't want my children to be the only ones. It's really kind of the same excuse, it's just different circumstances. If we're honest with ourselves, we recognize the truth really is that we're just, we're not trusting, we're, we're not following, we're not grasping that God is with us and that God loves us so wonderfully and deeply. In other words, it, 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 it's a moment of, of a weakness, or you can maybe even say moments of weak faith, then that was Elijah's problem. Things didn't happen the way he thought they should, and he simply let his human doubts and his human fears take over. <coughs> Elijah has a tremendous lesson to learn. The lesson he's going to learn is that faith is not based on what you think or what you feel. Faith, rather, is based on what God reveals and what God says. And Elijah learned just how wrong he was when he said he was the only one. God told Elijah he didn't know what he was talking about. And then God marvelously revealed to Elijah that there were still 7,000 believers in the land who had not bowed down to, to Baal or kissed him. See, Elijah didn't know the real facts. In essence, God was telling Elijah to quit complaining and get on with his work and get on with his and I, I think we're all going to have to recognize sometimes that that's exactly what we need to be told. Quit complaining and get on with the work. Quit thinking that you know better than the Lord our God or that you have a better way to do things than what he has allowed. We, we need people who humbly realize that God, God does know what he is doing. 
that what is going on is indeed God's plan for our eternal soul's sake? That the trial, the tribulations that you have in your life, they are there for your good and the good of others. To remember that God is with you, God is watching over you, that God is working to save you, to draw you to Him, to remind you to have faith and trust in Him, because that's what faith is. Faith trusts God. Faith follows God. Even when God shows us it might be painful or it might be troublesome, or even when it makes you feel it, you're all alone in His truth and in His wonder. The most important thing I think in our lesson today is I want you to grasp how God brought Elijah around. First, God sent his angel to feed and strengthen Elijah. That's a part of our text that we didn't have there. He's in the wilderness. He's crashed for the night, and then he wakes up, and there's an angel of the Lord there with him. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord feeds him. And Elijah sleeps more, and the angel feeds him again. And off of those two meals, Elijah is now able to go 40 days and 40 nights until he reaches Mount Horeb. That's how he gets to Mount Horeb, because the angel of the Lord was with him. And at Mount Horeb, did you notice how patient and how gentle God is with Elijah? I see, I want you to grasp that lesson because that's exactly how God's work. God, God works in our lives. Did you notice God was not in the wind? That God was not in the earthquake? God was not in the fire that followed. God was that gentle that soft, whispering voice. In other words, God is a God of love and grace, of care and compassion for his people. Because, and dear people, here's the truth of God. He invites and shares his love. For those people who think that God only threatens and punishes, that, that's, that's just not true. What is true is that God does share the consequences of not believing, but that's more a reminder of the reality than it is a threat and then God shows you exactly, if you pay attention to his word, he shows you exactly why you should want to believe in him. Because God shows his love. And that love, of course, is most graciously shown in Jesus. God sent Jesus to live the perfect life we could not. God sent Jesus to the cross. There, Jesus suffered the wrath and the anger of God against sin. A task that Jesus willingly took on simply out of love for us. That's right, Jesus paid for our sins. Jesus gave his life for ours as atoning sacrifice. And then, so we would know the wonder of this, Jesus was raised from the dead as proof of what he is and what he has done. Dear people, that's the gentle whisper of God's love in Jesus is not what the world would expect. The world would expect a Savior who comes with an army and whoops everybody. No. Our Savior came and died for us. Our Savior came and humbly gave his life for us. You see, that's, that's the wonder of the gospel. And, and since God's Son has given his life for us, well, dear people, what is there for us to fear? Or what is there for us to worry about? What I suspect is that most often, sometimes we, we, we don't hear that gentle whisper of God's love. See, we're, we're still looking for, you know, we're still looking in the wind. We're still looking in the earthquakes. We're still looking in the fires. We're still looking for other signs that we think are God. And instead of, of hearing in their churches, so many people get misled. Because why? Because instead of hearing in their churches how God forgave in Jesus, they hear how they must live. They hear about what they must do. They hear how they must be in order to demonstrate their love for God, and then God will love them. But in Elijah, we learn, and we're reminded of exactly how God works. Truth is, we fail. We have moments of weakness and doubt. We forget the wonder and the joy of our salvation, and we have a tendency to focus only on the here and now. And there is the Lord our God, not in the violent wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but the gentle whisper of grace that chases away our fears, that, that, that 
take away our doubts and our failings are forgiven. The God of grace and love. The God who has done it all for us. And all that God asks is that we believe. We trust in him and his son Jesus. Uh, now, you do know the end result of all of this in Elijah's life, right? You know how Elijah is now strengthened and renewed. And Elijah does exactly what the Lord wants. Elijah gets out there and Elijah gets about to the task that God has given to him. Elijah begins to appoint this person and that person to various kingships and rules so that God's purpose and God's plan can be fulfilled as God wants us done. And included in his work, something new that God, I think God has added to the list, is the appointment of Elisha. Because Elisha will now replace Elijah. In other words, God understood that Elijah was worn down. God understood that Elijah's trouble and, uh, you know, he understood Elijah's trouble and heart. And God was now indeed going to grant him his wish to bring him home to God's eternal rest and grace. And again, if, if you know how all of this ends, you will know that in the very near future, Elijah is going to get taken to heaven in a whirlwind. All because of the grace and the mercy of God. So though troubled at this point in our text, God's wonder gives Elijah the means to be renewed and strong in faith. God renews him to keep serving the Lord. And he gets those tasks done. And he once again boldly goes forth in the business of the Lord and it all ends up making Elijah look pretty good and faithful. See, that's, that's why we still talk about Elijah today. We speak about his faith and his wonderful service to God. But we need to recognize he had his problems and his troubles. But the Lord helped him through. And the Lord in the end granted Elijah the wonderful gift of eternal life. And remember, Elijah is only one of three who are taken directly to heaven. In other words, did not actually experience death in this world. The other two being Enoch and Moses. Pretty good company to keep. See, I, I believe the lesson's clear. Trust in the Lord God. Trust that he does know what he's doing and he does care deeply about you in everything. Trust that God loves you and that his son Jesus is your savior who grants the forgiveness of sins and eternal life just because of the faith God has given you. And trust that God, as he did for Elijah and Elisha and so many others, including Jesus. God will cause your life to be one of service and honor to him just because of his grace and mercy. So as God leads us in our lives, let us be filled with marvel. Let's, let's continue to hear that, that still small voice of the Lord because that still small voice is always heard for us in the written revelation of God. Because in God's word, there's everything we need to know. There's everything we need to believe. There's everything we need for the assurance of our salvation. It's all revealed in God's holy word, especially, especially that beautiful and that awesome gospel message of Jesus. It's still the whisper of God for our lives, still the whisper of his grace and his love that we so, so desperately need. Oh, and, and, and lest we forget... Did you know that God actually causes Elijah to come to him? Elijah fled, and then God sends the angel, and Elijah, Elijah's then led to go to Mount Horeb. See, that, that's how he ended up in that cave at Mount Horeb. God knew exactly what Elijah needed. And, and that's why God keeps encouraging us to hear his word and, and to, you know, to be filled with his marvel, so, so that we can get and we can find exactly what we need for our soul's sake. Sometimes even, even the strongest among us, they need the help and they need the love of God that God will certainly give to them in their Savior, Jesus. So, so dear people, I want you to grasp, if we were to kind of allegorize this, I want you to grasp that your church is your Mount Horeb. That's your Mount Horeb where you get to come and hear that quiet and strengthening whisper of God. And I pray that you stay in God's word. I pray that you got, grasp that God does and, and God will meet your needs as, as you come to him. And then strengthened, we're just going to go out there and we're going to simply serve the Lord our God. That, that, that's what happens when, when faith is 
put in God and, and not in ourselves. And I pray, keep, keep whispering, Lord. Keep us strong and sure in you. Amen.